Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to you to the second of the evening lectures uh, organized by the new Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy, which we've established this semester at the Graduate Institute. It's a great pleasure and a privilege to welcome those of you who were here for Professor Stephen Holmes' lecture back. For those of you who are here for the first time, this is so that you know we will be doing three to four public lectures every semester. The next one is on the 15th of May, and we have Kaushik Basu, who used to be the chief economic advisor to the government of India, but also to the World Bank as our uh, speaker. He was a colleague, actually, of Albert Hirschman's in uh, Princeton, and he will be talking about the economic implications of uh, globalization and democracy. Tonight, it's my pleasure and a great privilege to welcome a friend, Professor Arjuna Padurai, who is among the leading theorists of globalization in the social sciences. In fact, I should say, Arjun, as usual, was ahead of the curve. He started writing on globalization before it became a fashionable topic at all, and therefore is among its very early analysts in sociology and anthropology. He has a wide range of books and articles which explore the genealogies of cultural globalization in particular, its entanglement with violence, the transformations of contemporary capitalism. The most recent book is on finance capital, but of course he has also looked at topics which are uh, central to political globalization, the decline and the uncertain future of the nation state about which he will have something to say today, migration and media. His work on democracy has been both with relation to the idea of the nation state, the, its relationship and its fraught relationship of the nationalist project to minorities, but also he has an optimistic side to the earlier work on globalization and democracy. We're going to hear if that optimism still holds, but his work has been also on grassroots movements, grassroots movements for democracy in India, especially among urban slum dwellers in Bombay, where he has been extremely active in even founding an NGO, Pukar. He's the Goddard Professor in Media, Culture, and Communication at New York University, and an honorary professor at Erasmus University, Rotterdam, and at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. He has had a long and distinguished academic career in the US at the universities of Yale, Chicago, University of Pennsylvania, where he spent several years, and then at the New School in New York, where he held office as provost and vice president for academic affairs. He was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1997. He has served as a consultant or an advisor to a wide range of public and private organizations, including the Ford Foundation, MacArthur and Rockefeller Foundations, the UNESCO, the UNDP, and the World Bank, and the National Science Foundation. Currently, he serves on the advisory board for the Asian Art Initiative at the Solomon Guggenheim Museum and on the scientific advisory board of the Forum d'Avignon in Paris. So that shows you some of his activities in the range of also public arts, which is a really wide range of engagements with um, topics of cultural uh, globalization. He has authored numerous books, of which I'm just going to mention three here, because I think they're going to play some role today. One is Modernity at Large, Cultural Dimension of Globalization. The second, The Fear of Small Numbers, and I'll come back to that in a moment. It has a very interesting subtitle, and as usual, Arjun was ahead of most diagnoses of his times. The subtitle is Fear of Small Numbers, an essay on the geography of anger. And this was in 2006, when Arjun is already thinking about the politics of anger and resentment, which is fueling the rise of the global right, as we will hear from him today. His latest book, The Future is a Cultural Fact, Essays on the Global Condition, uh, as I said, is on um, finance uh, capital. His books have been translated into French, into German, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, and Italian. 
Arjun has not only been a leading thinker, but he has forged some of the very concepts which we use today to think about global flows. And many of you may be familiar with his work on deterritorialization and especially with his formative phrase, scapes. Ethnoscapes, technoscapes, ideascapes. So this whole vocabulary, I think, stands in contrast and that marks his scholarship and that with that I will give him the word. The fact that Arjun's very early essay on difference and disjuncture is pointing to a third way out of a liberal understanding of a linear model of progress culminating in globalization. That's not the route he takes. But he also doesn't take the Marxist route of using a vocabulary of either determinacy or dependency. Instead of which he shows how these various flows of capital, of media, of ideas, and of people, migration, are entangled with one another, but however, in disjunction. And therefore, from some of these disjunctions are produced some of the affects that we are seeing today culminating in a politics of the global right. Nationalist politics, which is, however, transnationally aligned with one another, ironically. Warm welcome to you, Arjun, and you have the word. Um, I want to begin with uh, some thanks and some uh, acknowledgments. Uh, first of all, to Shalini and her colleagues at this new uh, wonderful center formed uh, in recognition, I suppose, and in continuing commitment to the ideas of uh, Albert Hirschman. And I only have to say, in addition to thanking Shalini for her wonderful and indeed uh, hard to rise to introduction, that invariably when I'm on some podium with Shalini, she either asks me questions or makes formulations about my work which are much deeper than the work itself. So my gratitude is uh, considerable. I wish you could give this talk. It would solve all of my problems, uh, but thanks. Uh, also a word about uh, Albert Hirschman, whom I had the pleasure of getting to know in the year 1989 to 90, when I was a, a guest, a scholar at the Institute for Advanced Study. And uh, he had this tremendous way of uh, coming and knocking on the door of very young people whom he only knew because they were coming that year, and introducing himself in the most unassuming way. And then after two seconds, we'd all go, Oh, you're Albert Hirschman. But then remain always available to have lunch, talk about your book, ask your views of things. Truly uh, a, long, uh, a remarkable man, and his wife was also a remarkable uh, woman who worked on literature and organized reading sessions for poorer populations in Princeton. Both uh, really great. And I've, uh, I was already an admirer of such of his work as I knew and grew to be an even greater admirer in the years uh, after, as you will see uh, from my remarks uh, today. So I'm very glad to be back. I've been here once before, also courtesy Shalini, about, I think, three years ago, maybe, uh, perhaps in this very same room. And we had a wonderful and uh, stimulating evening, but it was my first visit to this institute. This is the second. and. Uh, I know even more now than I did then about what goes on here, the remarkable range of scholarly endeavors, uh, student interests, uh, projects related to world politics, world culture, and world development of the widest variety, uh, very distinguished uh, faculty, some of whom I have the honor to have uh, uh, known uh, in the past, uh, and I even in this room uh, today. Uh, and others of whom I've met more recently. So I'm very, very honored to be here, uh, both at the Institute and in the context of a center uh, named for and in honor of Albert Hirschman. So 
I should also say this talk is more or less going to be based, I'm going to read from, uh, to save time, I'm, I'm not going to try to be chatty or informal. This is going to be on the rock, straight up reading, uh, but I'll try and not let you go fully to sleep. But I should say uh, that this uh, talk and the essay from which I'm reading uh, are just this month coming into print as part of a collection put together by the German publisher Surkampf. And today I saw uh, through someone, uh, the French translation is already out. I think the German translation also, but it's being launched tomorrow in Berlin. And there's an English translation coming out from Polity and about eight other language translations more or less coming out together, including Chinese, Bulgarian, Italian. So this momentous book with about 12 essays, so I'm very honored to be part of it. And I say this partly as a shameless promotion, not so much for my essay, which you have to listen to anyway. And you don't have to read the book for that or buy the book, but there are some really distinguished people in that book, uh, scholars uh, of democracy, of liberalism, and in many cases of Europe, but also beyond. So I urge you to look for the book, which is in English, The Great Regression, and translated more or less literally into French, German, and so on. So you can look for the edition that suits you. But I also want to acknowledge that this talk is right at the time when this is going to appear uh, in print, but I could not resist giving this talk here today because of the link in the talk, purely coincidental to Hirschman's ideas. And so when Shalini asked me to give this talk, I thought, oh, what could be more perfect? Plus, it's not really appeared, so most people likely have not seen it. So here we go. So the essay is called Democracy Fatigue, Fatigue. The central question of our times is whether we are witnessing the worldwide rejection of liberal democracy and its replacement by some sort of populist authoritarianism. Strong signs of this trend are to be found in Trump's America, Putin's Russia, Modi's India, and Erdogan's Turkey. In addition, we have numerous examples of already existing authoritarian governments, Orban in Hungary, Duda in Poland, and major aspirants to authoritarian right-wing rule in France, as we very well know this week, Austria, narrow win since I wrote this essay, and other EU countries. The total population of these countries is almost a third of the total population of the world. There's been growing alarm about this global uh, shift to the right, but we have relatively few good explanations for it. And in this talk, I offer an explanation and a European approach to building an alternative. So my first section is called Leaders and Followers. We need to rethink the relationship between leaders and followers in the new populisms that surround us. Our traditional habits of analysis lead us to imagine that major social trends in the political sphere have to do with such things as charisma, propaganda, ideology, and other factors, all of which presume a strong connection between leaders and followers. Today, leaders and followers do, of course, connect. But this connection is based on an accidental and partial overlap between the ambitions, visions, and strategies of leaders and the fears, wounds, and angers of their followers. The leaders who have risen in the new populist movements are typically xenophobic, patriarchal, including the women, and authoritarian in their styles. Their followers may share some of these tendencies, but they are also fearful, angry, and resentful of what their societies have done or not done for them and to them. These profiles do, of course, meet, especially in elections, however rigged or managed they may be, but this meeting place is not easy to understand. Why did some Muslims in India and the US vote for Modi and Trump? Why do some women in the United States adore Trump? Why do groups from the former GDR now vote for right-wing politicians in Germany? Addressing these puzzles requires us to think about leaders and followers in the new populism somewhat independently of one another. So I begin with the message from above, leaders. The new populist leaders recognize that they aspire to national leadership in an era in which national sovereignty is in crisis. The most striking symptom of this crisis of sovereignty is that no modern nation state 
controls what could be called its national economy. This is equally a problem for the richest and poorest of nations. The US economy is substantially in Chinese hands. The Chinese depend crucially on raw materials from Africa and Latin America, as well as other parts of Asia. Everyone depends to some extent on Middle Eastern oil. And virtually all modern nation states depend on sophisticated armaments from a small number of wealthy countries. Economic sovereignty as a basis for national sovereignty was always a shaky principle. Today, it is increasingly irrelevant. In the absence of any national economy that modern states can claim to protect and develop, it is no surprise that there has been a worldwide tendency in effective states and in many aspiring populist movements to perform national sovereignty by turning towards cultural majoritarianism. Ethno-nationalism, cultural, uh, uh, sorry, uh, my pages are, cultural majoritarianism, ethno-nationalism, and the stifling of internal intellectual and cultural dissent. In other words, the loss of economic sovereignty everywhere produces a shift towards emphasizing cultural sovereignty. This turn towards culture as the site of national sovereignty appears in many forms. Take Russia in the hands of Vladimir Putin. In December 2014, not much noticed around the world, Putin signed a decree setting up a state cultural policy for Russia centered on the maxim, Russia is not Europe. Reflecting an explicit hostility to the cultural West and to European multiculturalism, which Putin has characterized as neutered and barren, both being loaded sexual expressions, it enlists Russian masculinity as a political force. This rhetoric, rhetoric is an explicit call to return to traditional Russian values and is anchored in a deep history of Slavophile sentiment and Russophile cultural politics. The immediate context for this document was the battle over the future of Ukraine, and it underlay the cancellation of concerts by a Russian, uh, the Russian uh, anti-Kremlin rock musician Andrei Makarevich, which, while reflecting the longer-term harassment of the musical group Pussy Riot. The policy calls for a unified cultural space, this is Putin's phrase, throughout Russia and makes it clear that Russian cultural uniqueness and uniformity are crucial tools to be used against cultural minorities at home and political enemies abroad. Turkey under Recep Tayyip Erdogan has also turned culture into a theater of sovereignty. The main vehicle of his strategy is to advocate a return to Ottoman traditions, language forms, and imperial grandeur, an ideology that his critiques, his critics have dubbed neo-Ottomanism. This vision of Turkey also encodes its global ambitions, its resistance to Russian interventions in the Middle East, and acts as a counterweight to the country's aspiration to join the European Union. This new Ottoman posture is a key part of Erdogan's endeavor to marginalize and replace the secular nationalism of Kemal Ataturk, the icon of modern Turkey, with a more religious and imperial style of rule. The country has also witnessed considerable censorship of art and cultural institutions alongside direct repression of popular cultural dissent, as in Gezi Park in 2013. And now, since I wrote this essay, of course, Erdogan has moved a further step with his referendum towards the one-man rule. In many ways, Narendra Modi, the right-wing ideologue who now enjoys the prime ministership of India, offers the best example of how the new authoritarian leaders produce and maintain a populist strategy. Modi has a long career as a party worker and activist for the Hindu right in India. He served as chief minister of Gujarat, the state, from 2001 to 2014 and was implicated in the statewide genocide of Muslims in Gujarat in 2002 after some Muslims attacked a train carrying Hindu pilgrims through the state. Many progressive Indians still believe that Modi actively orchestrated this genocide, but he has managed to overcome many judicial and civil condemnations and won the campaign to become Prime Minister of India in 2014. He's an open advocate of Hindutva, Hindu nationalism, as the governing ideology of India, and like many of the current crop of authoritarian populists across the world, he combines extreme cultural nationalism with markedly neoliberal policies and projects. 
Under his now almost three-year leadership, there has been an unprecedented number of assaults on sexual, religious, cultural, and artistic freedoms in India, anchored in a systematic dismantling of the secular and socialist heritage of Jawaharlal Nehru and the nonviolent vision of Mahatma Gandhi. Under Modi, war with, Pakistanis, uh, with Pakistan is always a heartbeat away. India's Muslims are living in growing fear, and Dalits, the lowest caste, previously untouchable, are brazenly attacked and humiliated every day. Modi has brought together the lexicon of ethnic purity with the discourse of cleanliness and sanitation. Indian cultural images abroad, highlight, highlighting its combination of digital modernity and Hindu authenticity, and Hindu domination at home, are the cornerstones of his version of Indian sovereignty. And so it is with our latest nightmare, the victory of Donald Trump in the US elections of November 8, 2016. This event is still relatively recent, so even hindsight is in poor supply. We cannot expect his victory to, and I wrote we cannot, I would say we could not, but we cannot, this was written very soon after he'd won, expect his victory to moderate his style. Trump's message, which combines misogyny, racism, xenophobia, and megalomania on a scale unprecedented in recent history, is centered on two extreme messages, one implicit and one explicit. The explicit message is his aim to, quotes, make America great again by beefing up foreign military options for the US, renegotiating various trade deals that he believes have diminished American wealth and prestige, unshackling US businesses from various tax and environmental constraints, and above all, by making good on his promises to register all Muslims in the US, deport all illegals, tighten up American borders, and massively increase immigration controls. That's the explicit message. The implicit message is racist and racial and speaks to those white Americans, white Americans, who feel they have lost their imagined dominance in American politics and economy to blacks, Latinos, and migrants of every type. Trump's biggest rhetorical success is to put the Greeks of whiteness into the Trojan horse of every one of his messages about American greatness. So that making America great again becomes the public way of promising that whites in America will be great again. For the first time, a message about America's power in the world has become a dog whistle for making whites the ruling class of and in the US again. The message about the salvation of the American economy has been transformed into a message about saving the white race. This then is what the leaders of the new authoritarian populisms have in common. The recognition that none of them can truly control their national economies, which are hostages to foreign investors, global agreements, transnational finance, mobile labor and capital in general. All of them promise national cultural purification as a route to global political power. All of them are friendly to neo neoliberal capitalism with their own versions of how to make it work for India, Turkey, the US, or Russia. All of them seek to translate soft power into hard power. And none of them has any reservations about repressing minorities and dissidents, stifling free speech, or using the law to throttle their opponents. This worldwide package is also visible in Europe, in Theresa May's UK, Viktor Orban's Hungary, Duda's Poland, and of course, Le Pen's vision of France, whether it'll become Le Pen's France, we'll find out very soon, uh, and, and others in virtually every uh, other country in Europe. So in Europe, the flashpoints for this trend are the fear of the latest wave of migrants, the anger about the various terrorist attacks in some major European cities, and of course, the shock of the Brexit vote. Thus, populist authoritarian leaders and demagogues are to be found everywhere across the old continent, this one, and they too operate with the same mix of neoliberalism, cultural chauvinism, anti-immigrant anger and majoritarian rage as the major models I have discussed earlier, US, Russia, Turkey, India. So, so much for the leaders in these movements. What about the followers? 
I suggested earlier, and this section I call uh, Vox Populi, I suggested earlier that an explanation of the worldwide success of populist authoritarian should not assume that the followers simply endorse or replicate the beliefs of the leaders they seem to adore. There is, of course, a degree of overlap or compatibility between what these leaders decry or promise and what their followers believe or fear. But the overlap is partial, as I said. And, what, and the popular followings that have allowed Modi, Putin, Erdogan, and Trump, as well as May, Orban, Duda, Le Pen in Europe, to achieve and retain power have their own worlds of belief, affect, and motivation. To grasp some of what these worlds are like, I return to the famous ideas put forward in the political economist and philosopher, by the political economist and philosopher, Albert Hirschman, in his brilliant book, Exit, Voice, and Loyalty, written almost 50 years ago. Hirschman provides a powerful uh, understanding of how, in this book, of how human beings respond to a decline in products, organizations, and states by either remaining loyal to them, leaving them, or staying with them to protest the decline by voicing, which is his word really, opposition, resistance, or complaints in the hope of resistance or reform. The great originality of Hirschman's analysis was its linking of consumer behavior to organizational and political behavior, and his approach was a vital move in comprehending how long and in what circumstances, uh, sorry, just lost my head. Uh, what circumstances ordinary people could tolerate disappointment with goods and services before they switched brands, membership of organizations, or countries. Published in 1970, that's why I say almost 50 years, uh, Hirschman's book, offered a deep insight into modern capitalist democracies before globalization began to undo the logic of national economies, local communities, and place-based identities. It was also written before the rise of the internet and social media, and thus could not have anticipated the nature of disappointment and protest in the world of the 21st century. Still, Hirschman's ideas remind us that Brexit is all, above all about exit, and that exit is always in some kind of relationship to loyalty and to voice. How can Hirschman's use of these terms help us today? And there's been a whole literature, by the way, about Hirschman's ideas and refining them, tinkering with them, elaborating them, criticizing them, but they remain very strong reference points. So I suggested from the perspective of those mass followings, that is the people, not the leaders, that support Trump, Modi, Erdogan, and other established or rising figures of authoritarian populism, the, the exit that far too many of them are today supporting is a form of voice, not an alternative. So for Hirschman, exit meant voice is not working, let's exit. Exit now is voice. Hirschman was right that elections were the major way in which citizens enacted voice and showed how disappointed or happy they were with their leaders. But elections today and the recent US elections are an excellent example have become a way to exit from democracy itself rather than a means to repair and debate politics democratically. The approximately 62 million Americans who voted for Trump voted for him and against democracy. In this sense, their vote was a vote for exit. And so it was with the election of Modi, the election of Erdogan, and the pseudo elections in favor of Putin. And I'm sure you can add examples to this. In each of these cases, and in many of the populist pockets of Europe, there is, and here my title, is a fatigue with democracy itself. A fatigue which forms the basis for the electoral success of leaders who promise to abrogate all the liberal, deliberative, and inclusive components of their national versions of democracy. It might be objected that all populist leaders have thrived on this sort of frustration with democracy and have built their careers on it, going back to Stalin, Hitler, Peron, and many other leaders from the first half of the 20th century who exploited the failures of the democracies of their times and places. So, what is new 
about today's democracy fatigue. There are three ways in which today's widespread feeling of being fed up with democracy itself has a distinctive logic and context. The first is that the extension of the internet and social media to growing sectors of the population and the availability of web-based mobilization, propaganda, identity building, and peer seeking has created the dangerous illusion that we can all find peers, allies, friends, collaborators, converts, and colleagues, whoever we are and whatever we want. The second is the fact that every single nation state, I've argued this already, has lost ground in its effort to maintain any semblance of economic sovereignty. The third factor is that the worldwide spread of the ideology of human rights has given some minimal purchase to strangers, foreigners, and migrants in virtually every country in the world, even if they face a harsh uh, welcome and severe conditions wherever they go. Together, these three factors have deepened the global intolerance for due process, deliberative rationality, and political patience, perhaps the most important, that the liberal democratic systems always require. When we add to these factors the global erosion of social welfare and the planetary uh, penetration of financial industries that thrive on circulating the idea that we are all at risk of financial disaster, impatience with the slow temporalities of democracy is compounded by a constant climate of economic panic. The same populist leaders who promise prosperity for all often deliberately create this sort of panic. Narendra Modi's recent decision to root out black money, that is untaxed money, cash wealth, from the Indian economy by taking 500 and 1,000 rupee currency notes out of circulation is an exemplary case of induced economic distress and financial panic. In today's India, these currency notes are a vital part of everyday life for poor and middle class workers, consumers, and petty commercial operators since they are worth about 7 and 14 euros respectively. The best argument I've, I've seen for why he would do this, as a guy who's constantly saying, I'll bring you prosperity, is an insight from somebody else, it's not mine, that what you do is create a, a, a climate of suffering and sacrifice to show that building India requires pain. So what better pain than taking key currency notes out of circulation, making your economic everyday life miserable? And somehow that becomes part of enlisting you in the national cause but there may be other theories. But in any case, financial panic produced deliberately. The new chapter being written in the worldwide story of authoritarian populism is thus founded, as I have suggested, on a partial overlap between the ambitions and promises of its leaders and the mentality of its followers. The leaders hate democracy because it is an obstacle to their monomaniacal pursuit of power. The followers are victims of democracy fatigue who see electoral politics as the best way to exit democracy itself. This hatred and this exhaustion find their natural common ground in the space of cultural sovereignty enacted in scripts of racial victory for resentful majorities, national ethnic purity, and global resurgence through the promises of soft power. This common cultural ground inevitably hides the deep contradictions between the neoliberal economic policies and well-documented crony capitalism of most of these authoritarian leaders and the genuine economic suffering and anxiety of the bulk of their new, of their mass followings. It is also the terrain of a new politics of exclusion whose targets are either migrants or internal ethnic minorities or both. As long as jobs, pensions, and incomes continue to shrink, minorities and migrants will continue to be obvious scapegoats until a persuasive political message emerges from left liberal voices about restructuring income, social welfare, and public resources. This is not a short-term project, but it has to be a medium-term priority of the highest order. And here, since in my view, Europe is on the cutting edge, I conclude by returning to the old continent, this continent. So this last section is called, Where is Europe Headed? The consequences of the Brexit vote are still playing out. I wrote this some months ago. 
but they're clearly still playing out in France, among other places. And of course, in relation to Wales, I just heard Theresa May today trying to persuade the Welsh that they should hang in there with the United Kingdom. But its outcome indicates a mood in Europe that is not unrelated to the global trend to the right and to a growing ambivalence about the EU in many of its member states. Leaving aside the details of UK politics, some general observations come to mind. The first is that Brexit is only the most recent version of a long and recurrent debate about what Europe is and what it means. This debate is as old as the idea of Europe itself. The question of Europe's boundaries, identity, and mission has never been resolved. Is Europe a project of Western Christendom? Is it the child of Roman law and empire? Or of Greek rationality and democratic values? Or of Renaissance humanism and secularism? Or of enlightenment, universalism, and cosmopolitanism? These alternative images have struggled with one another for centuries and remain the subjects of deep division. They are images espoused by different classes, regions, states, and intellectuals at different times, and none of them has ever been completely hegemonic. Neither has any of them moved out of the picture entirely. They're all around today. They have also coexisted with bloody internal wars, massive religious schisms, and brutal efforts <clears throat> to eliminate minorities, strangers, heretics, and political dissidents. This combination of factors continues to be relevant today. The only one which is not relevant directly is that Europe does not have an empire. Imperialism officially is gone, but all these other things are still very much around. I'll, I'll return to that point in a second. It is not difficult to see that the fear of new immigrants as well as of existing migrant populations is a major part of the recent growth of arguments against the EU in its core countries, such as France, Holland, and Germany, as well as in Poland, Hungary, and Slovenia, which resent the efforts of the EU leadership in Brussels to dictate quotas, criteria, and legal categories in relation to refugees and other migrants to countries facing the immediate impact of new arrivals. It is also evident that this resentment is compounded by the sense that membership in the Union represents a net loss. for economic well-being, a net loss for economic well-being in many of its member countries, and that an exit would thus be in their best interest. But such exits are doomed efforts to regain the sort of economic sovereignty which is impossible to restore in the current era of globalization. Indeed, the debate over migrants, often at the forefront of right-wing political movements and agendas in Europe, is a prime example of the translation of issues of economic sovereignty into issues of cultural sovereignty, a translation and displacement, which I've already argued lies at the heart of the growth of right-wing populisms worldwide. In Europe, the variety of movements that endorse some sort of exit from the EU are also those that are using electoral processes to exit from democracy in the manner that I've argued is the case in the US, India, Russia, and Turkey. What the European cases of democracy fatigue bring more sharply to our attention is the wish of many political groups and movements to harvest the benefits of globalization without the burdens of democracy. In the case of Britain, for example, membership in the EU became associated with liberal ideology at home. Thus, Theresa May's uh, visit to India last year for discussions with Narendra Modi offers a revealing glimpse of the future of global neoliberalism in a world unburdened by democracy. The two leaders agreed on issues of cross-border terrorism, meaning Pakistan, and British financial investments in Indian infrastructure, but had tough words for one another on the question of Indian student visa quotas in the UK and the status of Indians who, quotes, overstay their visas in England. Hence, a Tory leader who rose to power on the Brexit vote and an Indian right-wing populist authoritarian of world rank are already doing business about how to ensure the free flow of international capital while horse trading over visas and migrants. This is a glimpse of how business will be done between the new authoritarian leaders of the world when they are no longer burdened by democracy at home and when they have been propelled into power by mass followings suffering from democracy fatigue. Trump and Putin already have cozy ties, as we all now know in vivid detail, 
And Trump's followers among Indians in the U.S. are already, uh, Indians, in, uh, Indians in India and in the U.S. are already closely allied. <clears throat> European liberal democracy is on the verge of a dangerous crisis. Democracy fatigue has arrived in Europe and it's visible from Sweden to Italy and from France to Hungary, regardless of the outcomes of recent elections like Holland and Austria, which were extremely close uh, and could have gone either way. In Europe, too, elections are becoming ways to say no to liberal democracy. In this scenario, Germany, where I'm now living, Berlin, is a, at a major and risky crossroads. It can use its remarkable wealth, economic stability, and historical self-consciousness, having especially to do with Hitler and the Holocaust, to hold up the ideals of the European Union, to offer a welcome to refugees from Africa and the Middle East, to pursue peaceful solutions to global political crises, and to use the power of the euro to expand the scope of equality, both within its borders and in Europe more generally. There's a side point here, which I won't take up time on, which is that very few commentators have noticed that the most heated debate at the level of the state and the public sphere about the migrant crisis was hot on the heels of the Euro crisis. And the very countries that were facing the brunt of the migrant arrivals, Greece and so on, had already borne the brunt of Brussels' cruelty about the Euro. So we'll come and culture later, but austerity before, and this cannot uh, really continue or it's not healthy for it to continue. So global, uh, so, uh, and Europe can use the power of the Euro to expand the scope of equality, both within its borders and in Europe more generally. Or it can also exit, close its borders, hoard its wealth, and, uh, I'm sorry, this is Germany now, and let the rest of Europe and the world solve its own problems. And there are many people in Germany who say, why are we worrying about all this stuff? The latter may be the message from the German right, but it would be a foolish option. Global interdependence is here to stay, and Germany's, German wealth is as dependent on the global economy as anyone else's. The exit solution would not be good for Germany. Need I say, it would not be good for France. It has no choice, again Germany, but to push for a democratic Europe, and a democratic Europe is a vital resource in the worldwide struggle against authoritarian populism. But for this scenario to work, Germany, and you may add some other country in its place, perhaps France, perhaps others, will have to convince its fellow EU members that it will not be the voice of austerity and imposed financial discipline, especially in southern and eastern Europe. In other words, a soft policy on migrants and cultural tolerance at home is not consistent with a harsh approach to internal European debt and a dramatic redu reduction in fiscal sovereignty for countries like Greece, Spain, and Italy, Greece in particular, essentially a wholly owned subsidiary of the international financial institutions. There is no Greek nation, practically speaking, at this point. The challenge here is whether Germany can support uh, the forces of liberal democracy in those European countries that threaten to move to the right and whether this is possible without putting Germany again in the role of a European hegemon. There is no easy answer to this dilemma, but it is not one to avoid. German liberal democracy cannot survive in an ocean of European authoritarian populism. And we can say this about all the other liberal democratic visions in Europe, the same is true. So in the end, there is only one path ahead. And that is for European liberal publics, workers, intellectuals, activists, policymakers, to make common cause across European internal borders to argue for economic and political liberalism. We need a liberal multitude. That is the only answer to the regressive multitude which is currently on the rise in Europe and beyond. Thank you very much.
So thank you, Arjun, for this uh, really wide-ranging speech with a resounding call for a liberal multitude. Now we'll have to discuss with you how such a multitude can be formed and what kind of political agendas it may have. But I think that with that, we are really at the heart of the uh, question because I think uh, you are very right in a lot of the diagnostic statements which you have made. Why have we got to here? this impasse and what can be done. So with that, let me turn to the questions. Um, can I give you a mic? Thank you very much indeed uh, for this um, elaboration. I have a question. Would you uh, oh, just introduce sorry. yourself uh, okay. just very briefly yes, so that he knows? Yes, of me. course. My name is um, Doreen Mender. I'm um, the head of um, the CCC research program at the Haute École d'Art et Design here in Genève. It's an international research program for artists and theorists. And I have a question with regard to this uh, liberal democracy in relation to the year of 1989, particularly also with regard to, you spoke about the German condition, the German-German condition. Uh, I wonder whether it also has something to do with the, the great moving right show that is going on now uh, at this moment. Um, has something to do also with the fact that in 1989 a form of overtaking erasure of alternative to liberal democracy was at stake. I mean by kind of erasing uh, the alternative of um, socialist or of a leftist politics. Because this is something that um, in, in the East, I mean, it's something I've been thinking about a lot because I'm from East Germany. So that's something, why is this case now going on? How, 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 do, you, how do you look at this moment of 1989 in relation to the contemporary condition and the kind of the politics of denial, the return of the repressed? And uh, how does this really connect? Uh, what do you think about this? Because I think in 1989, the whole restructuring process took place on a new world order. And uh, it's been, it is erased. So the liberal democracy model has been kind of, one almost could say, colonizing the idea of an alternative to uh, the kind of the other side of the, of the Iron Curtain, so to speak, of the global Cold War. What do you think about that since you sit yeah. there? Thank you. Uh, let's see. It's on. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, thank you. So this is a very important question, and it raises. Uh, uh, set of questions both about Europe as well uh, as about the Cold War and about the continuation of uh, some kinds of domination even after empire by powerful countries which are now not only in the West but Russia, China, uh, uh, even India uh, in certain parts of the world dominating. Uh, so it's not something I address here. And I think we need to think aloud about this, but my very uh, spontaneous uh, thought, which is not a well thought out or uh, a theory or something like that, it's just an instinctive idea, is that there's no doubt to me that 1989 created a new dynamic of aspirations which were caught up in the idea of democracy, modernity, and market. That was the message after 89, that these things are all one, they're parts of one another, and they came with the heaviest force onto uh, sort of Mittel Europa, uh, which was brutalized by the message that this is the way to go. And the whole of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, but I think significant parts of Germany, especially on the East, etc., uh, really suffered when this great moment of liberation happened. And I know living in Berlin today that a lot of the dynamics of everyday life in Berlin is by East Berliners who are miserable in the new order, who feel like second-rate citizens. And it's very evident to me why they may move to the right, even when their politics was of, a, of the socialist times. 
because they feel second class. Um, and this playing to the second classness is what the far right does, what Trump has successfully done, and what others do in other parts of the world. So that's one part, I think, is people who have both suffered and were profoundly disappointed because they knew that things were wrong with the older order, but they thought something new will happen and they can tell you all the time how nothing has changed for them. And things have actually gotten worse. Corrupt leaders, uh, less jobs, less salaries, this recent uh, strike of uh, airline workers in Germany. I was stunned to see it was about an increase from 11 to 12 euros an hour. I mean, an American worker would have this salary, you know, for one minute, you know, um, and yet, German management was sitting very hard on them for this small, so I can see lots of issues like that. But the other one is the Cold War and its broader context in, in the immediate uh, wake of World War II and in the context of decolonization. So these are interests I have to reveal. I'm now thinking about a lot uh, because my wife is working on uh, Yugoslavia and India in the period of non-alignment. So she is giving me a lot of new scholarship and new ideas about decolonization, about empire, about the ways in which empire has actually disappeared or not. Uh, the vision of some kind of world in the early period of non-alignment that people like Tito joined in, which is now more or less buried. And the only thing I want to say, because I don't have a clear answer to what you're saying, is I, I think that's a very important question, is that that vision, let's call it the non-aligned vision, which quickly became sucked into the orbit of the big powers and sucked in by the IMF and the World Bank, developmentalism, blah, 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 still was a vision. It was a vision. And to me, it belongs in a history of subordinated ideas about Europe. Uh, ideas at the margin, ideas by minorities, ideas from here or there. And I will only say that I, uh, along with my colleague, uh, Regina Romhild at uh, Humboldt, who is my closest colleague in Berlin now, we are hoping to do a project on what she calls in the German version, under Europe. That is, what is the history of these alternative ideas? Because I mentioned in this talk that Europe has always been contested, and it is still contested. But in that contestation, what happens is that all kinds of ideas get relegated to the margins or totally forgotten. But it's an archive we need to reopen because it has possibilities for the now. That's as far as I could go. Already too long of an answer for a person who does not have an answer <laughs> to your question. Uh, good evening, Professor. Thank you so much for those comments. And especially as somebody who has seen demonetization had, had suffered because of it, the comment about sacrifice, etc., really was like a light in a dark room, you know, it suddenly gave, gave a lot of thought. Uh, my please, question, please. Uh, Anshul, uh, uh, my question is related to the last bit that you said and what also Professor Randeria had built upon, uh, the opposition and how, and especially in the case of India, uh, when the recent election took place in the most popular state and Modi, again, his party has won with a stupendous uh, majority. Uh, my anger is then towards the opposition and how it has completely failed to bring together any kind of uh, alternative platform to this swing to the right. Uh, I know I'm not that right in the context of a totalitarian power like Turkey, but again, in the case of US, uh, did Hillary Clinton and her version of, of, of the US give a good enough uh, opposition platform as it were? I'm sure in the case of India, the Indian National Congress does not give that kind of platform. So where does the opposition come in this uh, diagnostic version of, of, of the popular right swing that you have spoken about. important question, indeed a vital question, and looking forward, it is the question. Uh, because in a way we can say a lot about why these people have won, we can add something, but what can we do? Uh, as Lenin said, what is to be done, uh, has a kind of Indian ring about it, you know, what is to be done, uh, is very challenging, and I have a couple of thoughts about it, but the first part is to concede that uh, liberals and the left, whether in the US or in India, everywhere else, the organized left, the hard left, the soft left, basically have failed badly to tap uh, electoral sentiment, mass sentiment, populist sentiment, whatever you want to call it. 
And it's always stunning to me that in a country of 1.3 billion, more or less, India, there are about four people who seem to be serious leaders. In other words, who have charisma, vision, intelligence. This is in a country of 200 million graduates, 100 million, you know, highly educated, probably a million who've you know, gone to some kind of engineering, other institutions. It's a super smart country, full of scientists, artists, this, that. They ask, who's in Delhi? Like, nobody. Or for that matter, in Chennai or wherever, state capitals. I mean, it's a bunch of gundas and, uh, you know, uh, real idiots, but thugs, actually. So I don't need to tell you that, especially a person who's been in India, knows India. Uh, but it's, it's precipitous and it's statistically stunning. There are some answers, like politics is so corrupt, people go to other things, this, but they don't satisfy me. I mean, people could get in. My friend Yogendra Yadav is again making some effort. I mean, there are people who are genuine, smart, who want to do something, but where do they fail? And I would say there are many analyses depending on the country, US, here, there, but one common thing which somebody else gave me as an idea, so it's not mine, and I should name the person in the spirit of acknowledgement, uh, is a, a very important artist now in, uh, based in France, but who does a lot in Berlin, called Kader Ismail. So we had a dinner in which he said this. He said, the left, meaning liberals and left, have lost any capacity to produce or incite passion. Pa passion seems to have been given over to the right. I think it's a very interesting observation because yes, arguments for liberal democracy have a terribly boring sound about them. Usually because they involve due process, waiting, deliberation. I mean, what's exciting about that? But the truth is, you know, we do have models, and it's true that they had the empire as a context, Nehru, Gandhi, this one, that one in India, and others in the US who did not have an imperial power over them. Take Lincoln, for example. Very great orators, fabulous writers, who actually reached people on very basic ideas. And now there seems to be a kind of abstraction and a kind of uh, distance. And essentially it's a failure in the domain of affect. So I hear in anthropology around you know, there's some new terms, affect theory, you know, I don't know, it's kind of business class theory. I'm in economy as far as these things are concerned. But I agree that we need to think of how People who are not on the right, people who are against the right, whether wherever they are on the spectrum, can mobilize affect, if you like sentiment, if you like emotion, on a large scale basis without it being a manipulative exercise. I don't know how exactly, but at the beginning of an answer to Shalini's question, we cannot shun passion and see ourselves as a voice of reason and perpetuate that dualism and go sinking, you know, giving that message. Good evening. Thank you, Professor, for the excellent presentation. Uh, my name is Shireen Lindsay Hurst. I'm from the Institute for Media and Global Governance. And my question to you is this, um, hypothetical or not, in the event of a Marie Le Pen victory, what do you predict will happen to the sovereignty of Europe, the great Europe? And how will Europe then proceed to negotiate its sovereignty with its member states? What would be its strategy for the future? Thank you. Yeah, uh, again, a, a hugely timely question, um, and one, you know, which puts us, you and me and all of us, in a little bit of a crystal ball situation. But we can, without uh, being gazing and saying she will win, she won't win, it'll be by 3%, 2%, which is it, and anyway, not my expertise. I am uh, firmly committed to her defeat. I know some of the questions about Macron, but I'm sure he would be the best news, certainly as far as Europe, the EU vision is concerned, without a doubt. It's open and shut. And that way his message is correct. There's a choice here, it's a clear choice, it's a referendum on Europe, among other things. If she wins, I think in a way it'll be less obviously an immediate disaster for Europe or anything else as it seems it might be. Today already she's gone on TV saying, I'm no longer going to run my party. I'm going to be the president if I win of all the friends. I mean, people have to do this. I mean, 
If she wins, she'll have 25%. I mean, she will have hell. Actually, so will Macron. So they will all have to reach somewhere wider than they are, number one. Uh, number two, I think exiting Europe might be done formally, as it was done by the UK, but it's a disastrous mess on every index that you can look at. It's been a terrible mess. There's been a lot of backpedaling, a lot of second thoughts. Theresa May is still plunging forward because that's her platform. That's the only card she has to play. She has to make it work. But because there's a severe loss of national economic sovereignty, uh, my thought is nobody exits from globalization. So Le Pen's question will be, how do I exit from globalization? And she's, of course, made it clear she's against globalization. What does that mean? I mean, will we re-enter you know, a world which is even small compared to Brodel's Europe? No French goods will go out, nothing will come in. I mean, going back centuries, France and every other European country have been caught in huge regional markets, global markets, all that's going to be stopped. I mean, it's insane. So what it means is it will continue, but it will continue in a way that someone like Le Pen will have to present as being in the national advantage all the time. And that's going to be very tough because international markets don't dance to your national tune, whether you're Trump or anybody else. I mean, you might as well be in Namibia, you know, as far as global markets go. That's why I said the richest countries and the poorest countries are all, uh, you know, I always use the image for the US of being like Gulliver in Swift, you know? Huge bloody thing with a hundred threads, you know, like that, as far as the economy is concerned. Now, I can go and throw bombs somewhere, that is true. But as far as the economy is concerned, there's not a lot you can do. You're gonna to have, to, have to be in a global game. And how you can be a significant European country and play the global game and not be part of Europe, I would like to see. <laughs> Plainly, I think it's impossible and it's costly. So the minute Brexit happened, all the banking interests began to buy property in Amsterdam, Paris, here, there, London stuff begins to plummet. Uh, which actually would be a good thing, but it's not plummeted enough. That's a trouble to be healthy for the economy. But there are changes, costly changes. So I guess the short answer is I think the, the scary place in uh, Le Pen's France, if such a thing happens, or already existing in Trump's America, is the license to perform the politics of hate against minorities. That there's nothing to stop you. You can do it on your soil. It's not about the national, international economy. And do it there. And that's what Trump is doing fully, and Le Pen can try to do. Now, whether French political culture and the public sphere has enough controls to make that difficult, or whether you know the attacks in Brussels or in Paris or London will uh, or the, the celebrated death of this policeman, which was celebrated today, will say to will give people the sense, yeah, let's have a kind of all-out war against the banlieues, against minorities. It's a very scary thought. I don't think it's easy, myself. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Two questions up there. Can... Should we take a few? Yes. So, group. Yes. I'm going to suggest we're going to take three together. We group those. Hi, my name is Ted. I'm a grade 12 student going to Canadian International High School in Neuchâtel, Switzerland. I have a question about your integration between the global argument of this movement and when it pertains to the people and the leaders voting for the end of democracy, as you put it. And I can definitely see that in many of your examples from Erdogan's Turkey to Putin's Russia. But I, I think to make that broad sweeping statement over the whole movement, especially in situations throughout the European continent, where um, arguably the European Union and the European Commission isn't most exactly democratic of institutions. And a lot of this stuff in Europe, a lot of this movement's motivations in Europe have been not anti-democratic, but arguing to put more de democracy into the system uh, from that area. I'm just wanting your opinions and thoughts on that angle of the spectrum, and I want to have a better, fully understanding of your rationale for your argument. Okay. Hmm. 
Thank you for that talk. My name is Suchismita. Um, I, I had a question, which is maybe it might be more like a clarification. Uh, when you use, uh, so especially going with Albert Hirschman's formulation, and then you talk about exit is voice, and then you go on to say that there is, uh, the voting itself is a form of exit from the process of democracy. Um, I'm slightly provoked to think over here that isn't that a bit of an over-assumption? That when we say that we are voting to exit from democracy, it is almost, it is, this reminds me of what a lot of left liberal um, politicians and intellectuals were saying and bemoaning, you know, when the right comes to power, that you're voting for someone who is actually against democracy. But in that process, maybe we are actually not in tune with what the masses are probably wanting and thinking. So, I don't know, to me it sounded a tad bit, if I may dare say, use the word elitist, to just say that the vote itself is a form of exit. It's a terrible charge, but I, I'll, I'll take I mean, I would like you to expand a little on that. Maybe I misunderstood you, so maybe that. Thank you. My name is Rashid and I'm a French citizen, just worried about what's going on in France. Um, I would like to ask you the following. Um, tell me if I'm wrong because I haven't attended the entire conference. You're basically saying that crisis, economic crisis means um, more racism and more right wing. As far as Europe is concerned, uh, things are meant to go worse because we have a um, a continent not really accepting globalization, and you have, um, even in Germany, you know, there is growth, but the middle class is not profiting from growth. Uh, you've never had any, you, you've never had so much poverty as now in Germany. I know the case quite well because I've been living there for a long time. Um, so, what is the solution? Because things are meant to go worse. So, that is to say, according to what you're saying, that the global swing to the right is going to get worse. I personally think that um, if they get into power, people might understand what it really means. So as a kind of perversity thinking, is it the best way to solve the problem? Let them come into power. It is a sad thing to say, but that might be the thing to do. Yes, um, I'll, I'll try and be brief so that uh, Others can get a chance to raise their issues for our collective deliberation. On your question about Europe, uh, I think my view is actually more nuanced than uh, this text uh, communicates, and that's my fault, because in fact I put a lot of faith in Europe, because I think many institutions are actually intact, that the idea of a state that uh, does care for its citizens to some extent is intact in many countries. When you come from the US, it's all absolutely clear, maybe not from, say, Canada, but when you come from the US, it's very clear that there's a lot in play in Europe, both in the ideas and in the institutions, which could be very valuable. There are powerful forces uh, against it, uh, but I actually do believe that a great deal works. As far as Brussels and how people feel uh, about Brussels and whether they're really fed up with it or whether they want it to be more responsive in a, some kind of democratic way, that's an empirical question that actually goes a little bit beyond me. I have some intuitions about it, but I'm quite open on whether on the whole the complaints are that it doesn't work right or whether the complaints have crossed that mark and said, you know, it's fundamentally a flawed idea. It was a bad idea, we should never have signed on, let's get out, that, that difference. So it's, but it's open because I'm not an expert on that by any means. On your question uh, about exiting from democracy, you know, there's always that risk, of course. Uh, and alas, there's never any escape from el elitism. Because whether you believe that the masses are expressing what they want, or whether you say they're not expressing what they want, or they're expressing what they want, but it's not a good thing. You know, whatever, whatever you pick on the a la carte menu, you're gonna take a view from Delhi or Bombay or Chicago or Geneva or somewhere. It's very hard to say we are, as it were, rising from the earth with our opinions in academia. At the end, there's always some distance, there's always some risk. But I do think uh, 
I take very seriously the work of Mukulika Banerjee, for example, that elections are a hugely meaningful thing for women, for Dalits, and so on. And I, I, I've uh, said that in my own writings, and I admire that work, which is rare work, which is ethnographic, and it's about elections. Still, it's hard to deny that even though elections are a highly significant part of genuine expression of participation for very poor people in India, forget you know city people, you know, that this uh, participation is not being directed somehow uh, towards uh, an expression of frustration, and a frustration that's so large. Uh, and it's not hard to understand that frustration. You look at these farmers naked in Delhi. I mean, what are they expressing? Joy with participatory democracy? Or are they peculiar people who've come from Andhra and Haryana? I mean, these are just ordinary farmers, except they didn't commit suicide. They're still willing to march naked in, in Delhi. So I do think there's a deep unhappiness in many subaltern populations. But it's true, the complexity is they do vote. And when they vote, they vote for Modi, and I think that cannot be denied, but I think that's because whether it's Trump or whatever, and I hope this is not a kind of illusion of uh, an academic, it could be, it's always a risk, is because they want a solution now. Now. They, they don't want the, the wait, you know, it will take 20 years. I mean, it's not like Nehru in 1950. You know, after five five-year plans, you will all be, you know, people don't want any of that. They want it today. Uh, or soon, very soon. And then who they believe about that delivery, that's another matter. But So I think there's nothing, even when m someone like me says elections are exit from democracy, I don't mean to say that contemptuously. I mean to say people are fed up. What are you going to do about that? Uh, because the other side is doing very well with that. <laughs> so that's more or less my thought. Uh, on your question, I think we are largely in agreement. I, I do agree that... Uh, Globalization, I mean, maybe I didn't point this out enough in the talk, uh, has produced massive inequality, growing inequality between classes, nations, regions. There's no doubt on that debate where I stand, both also on India, poverty, poverty line, I'm clear that we have deepening inequality worldwide. So someone like uh, Mr. Piketty, you know, picked up on this and documented in a certain way, but it's not the first person to point this out uh, at all. He just got some very rich data and analysis support. So I quite agree with you. And I think that's why I said this kind of deepening inequality is also tied up with the incapacity, this is what I would add, of nation states to regulate their own economies. And so what they're able to regulate is kind of crony capitalism, both inside and outside, and everybody underneath sinks. Now as to German inequality, you know, there's some debate on this, even among German economists and all who know a lot more than I, it still looks to me as an outside observer from the US and who studies India and so on that, you know, there's poverty and then there's poverty. I think there's shrinkage of budgets, there's pressure, but I'll see pensioners in Berlin and all. You can still get the basics of an apartment, live somewhere, have a Krankenkasse. I mean, where's a Krankenkasse for the poor in the US? Zip. India, forget it. You know, go and die at the hospital, you know before the cemetery make a stop at the hospital, if you're poor, you know. Uh, so I still think, relatively speaking, these countries have something going, but overall, I do think people are not, uh, a lot of people are not benefiting from globalization, hence the receptivity to the message from the right. So I think we are mostly in agreement. Last round of questions here. Thank you, Professor. Uh, my name is Zafar Shaheed. I used to work in the International Labour Organization. Your question about inciting passion, oh, yeah. the left and liberals' inability to do that, I think one of the reasons may be that the left and some of its intellectual supporters have gotten tied up over the last 70 years, perhaps, 70 to 80 years, of excessive scientism, figuring out the statistics and mathematics and laying out a fact will lead you by logic in a certain direction. I think the classic example 
that we have, and maybe this is your movement towards your liberal multitudes, is if you analyze what happened a couple of days ago in France, both the people that came in with majorities have no program at all as such. Le Pen has a program, but it's not a positive program. They're not talking about economics anymore, the way that the left and social democrats have been talking about economics for a long time. They're leaving it open, and they're appealing to people on a sort of emotional basis. And then we'll see. Thank you. My name's Peter. Thank you for a very interesting lecture. You've spoken about the role that you think Europe could, should play in resisting the global right. Would you like to say anything about what other parts of the world, the role that other parts of the world might play, like Latin America, Canada, Indonesia, Japan? And I realize they're all very different, but if you would pick and choose, perhaps, in discussing their role. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Anushka. I work for the Asian Forum for Human Rights and Development. Um, I'm, I'm Sri Lankan, so I come from a country that has ex did experience its own swing to the right and has since then sort of swung back again. Um, so, but there is still a very pervasive sort of ethno-nationalist movement happening in Sri Lanka. So there's a very good chance that um, that right-wing sort of majoritarian fervor will again be then represented in elected government. So my question to you is, how does the sort of Sri Lankan government ensure that this democratic space that has been created is now protected and secured? And I think that's maybe relevant for other countries too that are going through this, that will hopefully one day come out of it. Um, how do you keep from backsliding again? And protecting this space that's been created. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, you said how Indians and Americans are becoming close allies. Um, yes, they both had a swing to the right, but would that bring them closer together or further apart? Well, maybe I'll just start with your question and then try and Please help me if I lose track uh, of your, your questions. I'll ask you just to flag them for me. Uh, on this question, I meant the followers of Trump and Modi are seeing things together, and Trump and Modi themselves see themselves as having some commonalities and have had some good communication. So it's not Indians and Americans generally. I think it's people connected to these two leaders see that there's a common emphasis on a kind of cultural nationalism which Indians in the US support for India <laughs> and therefore they're often aligned with Modi <clears throat> and they see it happening with Trump and they say that's fine, you know, we, we like it there and it's fine if an American leader wants to do it here, especially when we, let us say the Indian uh, population in the US is relatively exempt you see, they're not Mexican, they're not Hispanic, they're not black. So it's a kind of model minority syndrome. So because of that slight insulation, it's easier for Indians in the US, both to support Trump in the US and to support Modi long distance in India. So that's where the uh, sort of mutual sympathy operates, or I meant to say. It's not general that suddenly Indians and Americans are seeing things together. So that's one part. I'll go back to your question at the beginning about emotion, passion, and I think there were two parts to what you said. One was uh, the argument from statistics and science as having become far too much of a crutch or a tool. And I think that goes back to the one of the limitations of the Enlightenment, which was the idea of enlightenment. <laughs> Meaning you can change by changing people's minds and you can do that through education. These are the core things that the light of reason will push out the forces of darkness. We know not only has the story of development and modernization shown us that is wrong, but that light was shining the same time Europe was brutalizing most of the world. So light had an odd kind of ultraviolet quality, you know. Uh, <laughs> so we have to be careful with that light then and now. But separate from that, I think, is the issue of emotion. 
and affect and how do you uh, mobilize it? And there I think you commented that both Macron and Le Pen seem to be speaking to emotion. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Le Pen for sure, uh, because her vacancy in the Department of Programs, Ideas and All is, is stunning. Macron is like a slightly different case. I think he is, first of all, he does have some ideas and not all of them are things people like. He's, he's a neoliberal guy. He wants to unite right and left. He wants to be friendly to the market. Globalization also means for him not only be friendly to migrants, but also be friendly to the global market. There's a whole series of things we can identify, which he has given his direction on. Um, but I also think in some way my sense is that he's not succeeding up to this point by really playing with affect that he's still in a way a classically rational man uh, but understanding that he cannot speak lofty abstractions give big technical programs about decentralization or India Panchayati Raj, you know, some administrative lessons and hope to win elections. So he certainly knows how to speak and all, but I still generally see him as speaking on the side of reason and so on, and but doing so with some degree of purchase, but without uh, falling into the trap of reason versus uh, emotion. That I think is the main one that we need to find out how we can continue to inhabit the realm of reason, deliberation, and so on, but not refuse affect. This is an old division of which mostly we are the victims. So we always assume when there's a victory of the wrong ideas, that is the same as the victory of emotion over reason. I think these things we need to uh, rethink. Uh, your question um, is a very important one. Uh, because it's true that especially for a person with my career, which has been based largely on studying India and studying colonialism, which is what I was trained in before post-colonialism became, so I'm still a little behind the times, still trying to think through colonialism. Uh, but be that as it may, coming out of all that, it's for me a, a, an important thing to say there's something in Europe which is not just uh, something parochial, narrow, there's that, or entirely allied with world domination. There's a, I'm trying to problematize that and say, well, these ideas are not themselves uh, ideas about exploitation and so on, but they happen to go with that other project. So I'm actually trying to write something on that uh, contradiction. So I'm, in other words, more intrigued with European potentials, although most scholars of my type and my generation have more or less foreclosed the Europe question. You know, either Said or Foucault or some combination has been, you know, the Europe question is solved. To me, it's not quite solved or resolved. It's worth re-examination, partly because of the many suppressed histories in Europe itself that are not available to us anymore. That said, the rest of the world is very important, and I think its uh, lessons could also be very important. I mean, till recently, especially after 1989, when the wall came down, and all sorts of crises began to happen in Europe, having to do with the end of the Soviet Union and so on, I remember trying to write an editorial piece, short opinion piece for the New York Times, saying, you know, the European countries that are suddenly entering democracy would be well advised to go to India. We've been at this for you know, 50 years already. You know, struggling with diversity, struggling with national unity, struggling with development, struggling. How about taking some advice and not to speak of all the other non-aligned countries, the decolonizing countries? New York Times editors more or less laughed in my face. What do you mean Polish parliamentarians or German parliamentarians are gonna to go to Malawi, you know? It was like, what a ridiculous thought. Now I have more worries about giving that suggestion because I see what's happening in places like India. It's not exactly, you know, model UN parliament, you know, student parliament. It's a, a scary place. So it, I'm less clear uh, where, as it were, you might find highly energized, progressive, inclusive visions. And I think they can be found in movements 
in India, including some of the movements I've studied, slum-based activist, globalized NGOs and so on. I think there are many lessons to be learned, but if you look at formal politics, it's tough to go over the map and say, you know, there's a place. I mean, the closest you can come in South Asia is Bhutan. But, you know, Bhutan is not a large place. It's a monarchy. Yeah, they're very concerned about development. They've done a very good job, but it's not an example you can easily export. You could look at Bangladesh, look at India, you could say, but those places are very troubled. Pakistan, you know, you, you, you can't turn to. And in Africa, we know that the biggest hopes were South Africa and Nigeria, and each of them, you know, is very troubled, deeply troubled. So it's not easy, though I do think there are things to be learned from the South African experience, from the Indian experience, the Indonesian experience. I don't mean to poo-poo them at all, that's been my life's work. But I think at the level of formal politics, they've all proved to run into huge troubles. Europe is not quite there. So while it looks around, which I encourage, and think, I hope it happens more and more, I think they can also look back into their own buried histories, alternative visions of what it means to be Europe. That's my actual hidden kind of little message or hope or ambition. Question about Sri Lanka quickly. I can't really tell you uh, a good answer, though I've been to Sri Lanka now quite a few times. I was very privileged to work with people like Neelan Tirichalvan, ICES, and lots of younger people still today are doing very important work in and on Sri Lanka. And I see now that there's a very delicate moment um, and that the uh, Sinhala nationalist parties and the right-wing monks and so on have not disappeared. They're just in the wings. Uh, so I think it's a very challenging question. And I think uh, the only thing I can say is that the answer might lie both in fundamental structural things about the economy and inclusion by the radical uh, pushing of a non-genocidal agenda at every level, schools here, there, so far as it can be done. And uh, perhaps the work that has already begun on in the kind of truth and reconciliation mode. Because when you've had that kind of division in a country that size, the wounds are everywhere. And you have to have, so if you don't take the South African model or the Argentinian model or something, you have to make your own model. And people are doing that, of course. I do get reports, I get Sri Lanka people working on this. Uh, I know also people studying it. I don't know the outcomes, uh, but I think that too uh, has a place. But I agree with you that whether it's Sri Lanka or any other place which is teetering or oscillating, the question of Durable conviviality, cohabitation is extremely challenging. And the one reason for it is that by and large social science has been, all social science, anthropology, sociology, political science, infinitely better at the problematics of conflict and conflict resolution than of peace and its daily production as, as a very laborious task, which is mostly invisible. But since we don't look at it, we don't know. It's a little bit like what Goffman did with presentation of self in everyday life. We need something like a Goffman-like exercise about everyday life, except about the production of peace. That is the production of the absence of conflict, which is a very active business. But we, at least in anthropology, so far as I know, there's plenty of stuff on violence, conflict, genocide, suffering, memory, loss. But if you ask, and there is now a literature on happiness and so on. But if you ask, how is peace daily produced in Indian slums or this or that? I worked in some of those, and it's very tough to do, very arduous because it's mostly invisible. And it's very much, very transient. It's for example, what do people not make an issue about? Well, that's not easy to do the ethnography of that because it, it comes and goes very fast. Anyway, uh, these are things that come to mind uh, as some of the reasons why this is a hard exercise even for us. Thank you very, very much, uh, um, Arjun. I'm sorry there are uh, 
few questions left in the room, but um, I think it's time uh, to call it a day for today. Thank you very much for uh, some really provocative ideas, a liberal multitude, but actually you as the champion of European values and the other face of Europe is an unexpected... Never too late. I was reminded, in fact, of a very interesting um, remark of Sayyid Abdullah Brailvi, who used to be the editor of Bombay Chronicle, uh, the English newspaper in Bombay. When the British left, uh, he said, now that they have left, we can think of all the good things about them. <laughs> and I think there is a lot of wisdom uh, in that. He fought hard that they should leave, but now that they had left, he said, let's think of the good things about them. And I think uh, that there is, uh, there is a very interesting political project in uh, what you are saying, uh, in uh, recovering not only the uh, other face of Europe, if you like, but also in recovering the modalities of conviviality and of a daily lack of conflict. Uh, something which uh, would be a sort of an ethnography which um, would need fine-grained analysis of how is it uh, that there is a daily, it's not even a conflict resolution because it's not a conflict which gets resolved. How is it that some things never become a source of tension or if they are, what kinds of modalities are there to solve it at a, a local uh, level? So, A little about it. No? So I think uh, we have a, a, a large research agenda which got set out uh, towards the end. And thank you very, very much uh, for uh, all of these uh, ideas and sharing them with us. So I. Thank you. Thank you all.